With that, I, I think that leads clearly into a, a couple of you have mentioned experiences with private sector. Uh, you have mentioned incentives, and um, uh, we're going into. Uh, we we are actually here when countries are negotiating or trying to put the final um, dots on an agreement on financing for development. So, how? not least the private sector, but also the public sector, how to create sufficient incentives and disincentives that development is really a, a vehicle for achieving also a reduction of disaster losses directly. Peter. Yes, so thank you hugely for this opportunity. Um, you asking about this very strange name and what I am and what I represent. Um, I'm rather unique because I spent about 20 years uh, working for uh, cities all over the world, uh, helping them with disaster resilient strategies, C40 group, the Rockefeller Resilient Cities group. And I identified this problem. I identified this massive gap that we have between, between the understanding of climate change and the data we have on the ground and the ability or inability to make the right decisions about all the investments being risk sensitive. So, so what I did four years ago, I set up a charity to bring together world leaders in every discipline needed to bring together a platform, uh, a software model that could be downloaded by every region of the world to load in their data and enable them to actually use this as a decision making platform to create risk-sensitive decision-making and to attract capital from the finance community who would then be much happier about investing because they could see an, a, a place where this is connected up and, and there was transparency. But the really critical thing about the private sector is, of course, the private sector is dramatically affected every time there's a disaster as, as well as the public sector and the community. So this has to be a collaborative system. It has to be able to be used collaboratively by the communities, because if the private sector suffers because the community no longer are buying their things, or the private sector suffers a downtime in their factory. So it's in everybody's interests. So basically the concept is to have a platform where everybody loads in data, including the private sector, and then it's open to everyone to use through tailored interfaces where the communities can go into this thing, the private sector can go into it for water or energy or, or whatever. Rural farmers have their own uh, entry into the system, but it's one system and it's one set of data that is looked after by an independent group. And what has emerged here is the concept of a collaboratory or a collaborative laboratory which is set up at national level by the national government and then has regional collaboratories which share data and information. And this has been evolved by actually trying to take this platform into, into demonstration regions. And it happens that we're working with Cities Alliance and DFID in the Future Cities Africa project. And the first city we're going to demonstrate this in is in, in Accra in Ghana. Uh, and also we're hoping to come to Ethiopia, Mozambique and Uganda uh, uh, in the next two or three years. I'm very practical, this has got to be demonstrated. And we're also working in China. So the example I wanted to give you of a practical example of how public-private partnerships can deal with this is the amazing work that's going on in China in cities to deal with flood risk. As you know, there are fantastically big flood risk problems in Chinese cities. Right as we sit here today, there are massive floods happening in central China. And what they've done is they've, they've, the government have incentivized cities to create sponge cities where basically cities are designed and retrofitted to actually, instead of the water flash flooding off, to be stored underground in the city to slow everything down and then to be used for water supply and to be used for supporting green uh, systems in the city so that trees and, and things grow there so the city's cooler and the, and the public can benefit and parks are created to be storage places for water. And this is being done, and 14 cities are now being retrofitted in China at massive scale as public-private partnerships, because it's in everyone's interest to do it. New technologies are being developed, new ideas are coming forward. And it's a wonderful example of massive benefits that can come with this sort of scale of action. And they've got, I, I went to their conference in China a few weeks ago, 
and there were 3,000 people there from cities all over China wanting to learn about how to do this. So I think, but they are using quite advanced systems modelling because it, you have to link up the, the ecology with the human activity and the economics of human well-being, not the economics of GDP growth, but the economics of human well-being. Human well-being. Now, remember what Fatima said about data is money, but data also is a commodity, and these models cost money, but yours don't cost money. Would you like me just to explain the model? Yes. The, we, we've got a self-financing model for this, which would enable the government to have the, the, the support funded and the private sector. And the simple model is that this platform would be associated with an investment fund, and that investment fund could be drawn down into the mitigation and adaptation projects, and we take a 2% charge off that fund to, to run the system and, and the data extraction. And the, the, the platform will save so much cost on design and development of projects and speed them up that 2% is actually nothing. And it easily pays for, for gathering the data and doing it. So this becomes self-financing really quickly once the money flows from the, the value of having the platform. Thank you. We'll hear from some of the private sector participants here if this is an attractive offer. But before we do that, we'll ask Xavier Patel to uh, also react to the same. I mean, the mutuals and cooperative insurance system is 27% uh, of the world. It's growing to the 40% you mentioned. Yes. Um, just to go back to what um, Fatima mentioned, um, insurance um, does have an important role to play in disaster risk reduction and also as a buffer for these communities that are facing these perils on a day-to-day -day basis. Building resilience, building resilient cities means building resilient communities, but that means building resilient individuals and, in, and resilient households. Um, it requires a more of a wider holistic approach. We have to look at the wider risk that these individuals are facing on the ground on a regular basis. And these risks have to be tackled in order for them to, to give them the strength of bouncing back against such perils such as uh, disaster re disasters that we're talking about. And in this respect, um, we believe that microinsurance has proved to be an effective tool for protecting the assets of the poor and helping them, uh, preventing them from dropping further into poverty and using their existing assets in a more productive manner. Microinsurance delivered in the right way will also create a risk-informed pu uh, public who will understand the cost of risk and the value of risk management techniques. It reduces risk before the losses occur. And we can give one example in India where we have uh, an institution which provides health insurance in the slums in Pune. And there, it, whilst it's providing health insurance, it's also providing risk prevention strategies. It's providing uh, access to better health care and also advice. In this respect, you're finding you have stronger communities uh, who are better empowered and better able to make decisions and also better able to withstand the effects of disasters as they, as they, are, as they occur. This kind, of, this kind of empowerment can be found in all types of cooperative structures around the world. We have over a billion people served by different types of cooperatives, be they agricultural cooperatives, health cooperatives, housing cooperatives, banking and insurance. And all of these institutions are basically formalizing the inherent desire by these communities to step up from their current status, to protect themselves and protect their future families. So we would really stress that the cooperative model is a model which can be used for effective disaster risk reduction strategies in different parts of the world. The provision of microinsurance, and we believe in particular community-driven microinsurance, enables individuals not only to build back better, but also empowers them with the independence to protect themselves and not have to rely completely on donor handouts and state aid. In effect, microinsurance provides a cushion against the smaller, smaller shocks and enables a sharing of the cost of the larger shocks. This has also been recognized by the recent G7 initiative to deliver and develop climate insurance for an extra 400 million people over the next five years. 
as well as being an enabler of economic growth and sustainable development, insurance enables risk to be appropriately identified and understood. It also facilitates appropriate measures to be taken to reduce it and prevent its creation. We believe a better protected community who have means to recover from both regular and infrequent losses through risk transfer will certainly encourage greater risk sensitive investments into these communities. Thank you, Sabia. You know, when I listen to um, all of you uh, here now, um, we've tackled several things. We um, haven't resolved the issue of data yet, because I mean, we all know that the data collection, um, the processing of data, making it available, is not only it costs money, but it's actually a major exercise. So my bottom line question would be, um, to uh, all of you, and I give you a chance to answer that question before I open the floor. Is there a shared public private interest to assist in strengthening data collection and processing? Because it costs money. I heard in a different panel discussion a few weeks ago it was about health and indicators, but the representative of South Africa. He gave me some, or not me, there were hundreds of us, some astounding data of how low the registration rate of newly born is still in Africa. So he basically said, you know, you need to help me with this before you start you know, asking me to do all kinds of very sophisticated things. So is there a shared public-private interest in getting data collection up and running? Peter, I'm sure you will say that. Yeah, yes, yes, there absolutely is. And as, as I said a little bit earlier on, that shared interest within a, an independent, supportive co-laboratory supporting everybody, so it's not a government thing, it's something that supports the private sector and the government and the communities seems to be something everyone has jumped at whenever we've offered it in any place in the world. We've offered it in China, Mongolia, uh, India, Africa, um, South America, and everyone has said this actually probably is the way we should go forward. And the thing is that the data has to be connected to value. You ha people have to understand that. And if it's connected to value, then, then it, it'll be easy, easier to fund. So this is my idea about connecting it to the finance and taking a charge on the finance of the value that the data system creates for the investors. And then everybody wins, and then there's money available for everyone to, to improve the data and improve the, 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 the way it's used. And, and coming to the point about communities, we will create a gaming version of this platform so kids at school can actually look at their, their regions and understand the risks and actually begin to play games with, with what the issues are and what the problems are and, and actually understand it. So I think education is another part of this and, and I think we should have that in, in the agenda too. I think one good example I think was already mentioned with the hydrological and meteorological observation systems. I mean, they benefit the public good like emergency response, but at the same time also the information is very important for the climate modeling. But also at the same time it's in, in, uh, important for the insurance industry and there's actually no reason why not there should be also some kind of payment for this information available. The same thing with the air, air traffic um, meteorological systems are very important. So I think we have to be a little bit more creative on these elements. I mean they will be not for, for every kind of situation kind of available. But let me also add another kind of a dimension because I think sometimes, I mean, it's important to drive this risk assessment and the data agenda. That's very important. But on the other side, out of practical experience, I see there's also often very low hanging fruit of risk mitigation. When you have earthquake risks and you're seeing that buildings not kind of build a, a kind of a, with proper codes, when you see the transportation systems that there's not a proper drainage in the building, that you see in schools where the roof is not kind of uh, properly connected in a kind of a cycling risk area. So in many areas you can already improve risk mitigation without this kind of very sophisticated data systems. I mean, 
I think we need to separate different areas where can we intervene, where we can um, public private models and also where more modeling in more sophisticated ways is needed because I think what I would like to avoid to giving an impression that you always have to wait for invest in risk mitigation because in, in many areas it's a very kind of a low hanging fruit and very obvious uh, measures. And, Good point. You don't need to wait until you got perfect evidence if the reality did. What I would like to ask um, our two senior representatives from governments is um, we talk a lot these days about evidence based decision making. And um, my experience is that there's a lot of evidence. But as a Minister of Finance, if you want your Prime Minister and your Cabinet to agree, to an investment strategy that in 10 years will make Mozambique a lot less vulnerable to natural disasters? Is it the financial data that will convince them or is something else? <laughs> no, I think, I think if I start from financial data, the discussion will be very, very complicated. I have to use a um, number of, uh, uh, let's say, fatalities, uh, number of uh, people, uh, that, that type of, um, of uh, approach will, will receive more because, I mean, government at the end of the day is political motivation. It's not, uh, so anything that is necessary to be done to have people uh, well, uh, well fed, that would be good. Yes. So, but I come for the, the, the data, uh, data, data. I think that the problem is uh, in Africa, especially in my country, uh, who knows the importance of data is government? So we create an institution and we collect information. But the user of that information are very few. Not the, the community. You go to the middle class people. Yes. They have nothing to do with the insurance, for example. Mm -hmm. Even the basic, what it, which is compulsory, the motto uh, insurance, nobody is doing that, including the civil servants. So, if you have a problem like that, you have to start from the start, yeah. where you say at the school, Education. and you, you, you put that information at the school, mm -hmm. that uh, insurance is important. Because, you see, if you ask someone to, uh, to uh, contract the life insurance, if you go to, to, the, to the, the women or the... Or, 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 or wife, she will say, look, who is going to benefit if I die? And perhaps you say, no, you, you, you indicate, maybe your husband. And you say, no, sometime my husband, we have a big problem. So he will speed up, speed up, speed up, I mean the process. So I will, I will, I will die too soon. <laughs> so it's not a good idea to have this. But if you go to the men, they say the same thing. So it, this is why the ratio of uh, life insurance. insurance is very, 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 very little because of culture. Yeah. Because for Africa, uh, the insurance is number of kids that we have. Yeah, the number of kids we have. That is your insurance. You, you take six and you say, well, maybe four would be crazy. And one would die. And the, the other one, perhaps, would take care of them. So that is the, the way the thing we have. So uh, I think that is very, very, very complicated. Mm -hmm. We do have uh, micro uh, financial legislation, mm -hmm. but no, no one, uh, in terms of comp uh, insurance company, they are using that. Uh, and, uh, and and the government have this the problem. How we can set up, for example, micro for the rural area to prevent the natural disaster, mm -hmm. and the the question of uh, premium, who is paying the premium? If the beneficiary are not aware of the importance of insurance, and you ask them to pay the premium, that would be other problem. So I think the yes, data is good. You you can sell it, but depend who is going to to buy it, because even if you give for free, they are not using. So that the bigger problem that we have. But I think that your approach will help us to start from from education. Good. Thank you.
you very much, Minister. I think also with your comments, there are some questions to our other panelists here, so because, of course, you open some very practical and real issues. But how do governments take decisions? <laughs> <laughs> this is my chance. Yeah, well, um, I mean, the, the, as, as uh, the Minister from Mozambique was saying, um, basically we are having disasters all the time um, and, and uh, that that is has implicit the importance of having uh, the resources and the tools to cope with those disasters uh, for example uh, last year we have in Guerrero which is a state in the Pacific we have uh, two storms come together at the same time with very bad uh, with a very bad outcome there and it is very costly what what uh, the relief is going to be um, and really not the finances of Guerrero not even the the amount of money that we have in the fund we have in the fund something like uh, 20 billion pesos but the cost of the disaster in Guerrero probably is ar around 30 to 40 billion pesos um, there are some good examples for example in 2007 there was a flood in Tabasco and the cost was very significant uh, we did some infrastructure works in especially in water to to having some dams that prevent the flooding uh, three years after three years we have another flow the, the same rain came in 2010 and basically what happens is that there was a prevention measure that the, the infrastructure actually worked and it the government avoid a 30 billion pesos cost in damages there using that so that was a preventive measures that actually that actually worked the second time, not the first time, but the second the, the second time. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is that not all the insurance policies that we buy in Mexico actually have this same degree of uh, of involvement or, or of uh, sophistication, no, or of of efficiency. For example, we we buy subsidies for for agriculture, for livestock, and there, uh, basically, what we do is we subsidize the policy insurance to the peasants and to the agricultural producers and to to the to the farmers. And what happens is that there, for example, we don't have enough information. We don't know exactly how many hectares of land we are we are we are insuring. We are not. We don't know exactly how many heads of livestock we are actually insuring. We don't know exactly if the use of our subsidy is getting to the people that actually need that. Uh, and that's a problem, and that's an information problem, and also a, a problem of people saying or having, a, not perceiving the subsidy as something that is helping them to cover some event of nature, but at the subsidy as a transfer that they, they are entitled to. And that's a that's a problem there. Uh, so we still need to keep working on that on those type of programs. Um, this becomes especially important in our current fiscal situation, where uh, Mexico is an oil-producing country, and basically what happens is there is there has been a reduction in the oil price, that, which is more than more than 50 percent of reduction in the oil price, and that means that we have to the money that the resources that we assign to these type of subsidies, we have to use them in a better way, especially in those type of sectors. So that is working for in progress. Um, but we are, we have a bit difficult situation there because we have, for, on one hand, tried to convince people that um, this is not an entitlement that they have, that they have, and they 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 need to use that uh, money to cover actually for the risk that they are facing. I, I think you put another very important issue on the table now for the public domain is the perception that governments need to compensate and pay for everything, which actually used to be the opposite 50 years ago, then the governments paid a lot less. So <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on, but um, yes, I know. <laughs> But, uh, Sabir, from um, the insurance, there's several issues have emerged here. My original question on data, but also 
think the Minister from Mozambique said, as a government, we understand the importance of data, we generate information, but we don't really have any user. Can you help with that? Um, I'll try. Um, <laughs> I think just to go back on the issue regarding um, the, the take-up of insurance and the challenges relating to the take-up of insurance, uh, the whole concept of insurance is 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 a little bit alien to to the poor. You're, you're giving something and you may not get something back. It's a very much an intangible. So how do you sell that concept to somebody who has very little disposable income on hand? So it's either do you eat or do you give money for insurance? And I think the answer is very simple. So, I mean, this is what, what I was trying to refer to going back is the community-based approach. It has to come from the community for, able, for it to be able to actually really work and for people to actually understand what, what being protected actually really means. Putting a value to actually being protected is, is something quite difficult to achieve. And education plays a very important role in that. Um, and many of our institutions really proactively educate the public before actually delivering the products and they also en engage the public in developing the products as well. So they have a hand in everything that goes on in regards to delivering the insurance schemes to them on the ground. Um, a lot of approaches recently have been uh, very much a top-down approach where either governments are subsidizing insurance premiums and therefore people are not putting a value to them and that also instigates a number of uh, sort of uh, corruption problems amongst uh, find, making sure that the insurance products are going to the right people, the people know how to make claims, um, the premiums are, are being paid for the right people. So there's a lot of issues that are coming out from this sort of subsidization of insurance through the private sector. Um, the second uh, way that governments are trying to do it is to try and encourage and, enfor and enforce the, com uh, the formal insurance companies to go into this market. Now, these insurance companies have no idea and have never dealt with these markets, and they have never had any interest to deal with these markets. So by being forced to go into these markets, they are basically taking a very much a non-committal role. It's a very long-term approach to developing value-based insurance products to the poor. So I would go back to using the community-based organizations, the existing infrastructures that are there that have the trust of the people, and using these institutions to educate the people in terms of what actually insurance can do for them them, how it can help future generations, how we can lift them out of poverty, but also using them as vehicles to collect data. Because I think this is where we feel a real benefit of the mutual insurance lies, particularly at the low income level, is the proximity to the consumers, to know exactly what's going on the ground, what is the real data and what is not the real data. And people will only give you real data if they really trust you. So I think that's really important to sort of engage these institutions to be the vehicles to collect those, the data for you. And that would you know, involve empowering them, building their capacity to make sure they know how to collect the data and so on. But I would certainly try and use these existing institutions to overcome some of these challenges highlighted. Yeah, I think I think a lot of um, emphasis, uh, Margareta, goes on the production of data. And I think we don't um, sort of um, think across the value chain, as the Minister of Mozambique was saying, in terms of the pullback pullback factor, the utility of data. And I think we need to work a lot harder on not just the production, but also on how the data is used. Um, I think the question can be asked sometimes, are we producing the data that is relevant to where the priorities are? You know, are these two... Um, two things aligned. Um, and there's also the credibility of the data as well. Um, I think the emphasis is, should also be on the data quality. And I think that, again, goes back to the point I was making about improving the whole infrastructure of how data is collected, how data is perceived, how it's translated, and how it's communicated. Because very often data um, is not data that most people can use. Um, an ordinary farmer you know, would find it very hard to take that data and, and use it because it's not communicated in a language that he or she would understand. So I think that that also needs to be looked at um, in, you know, in, with more depth. Um, and then one other point I wanted to make is that um, I think we're always or at least the tendency um, that I tend to see is that um, 
when we're talking about disaster um, risk or, or we're talking about um, losses um, that are occurring as a result of climate hazards, I think they're always equated um, in terms of economic losses. And I think we sometimes forget cultural losses because I think every time a population is displaced, you know, there's a whole culture that is lost. Um, if a group of uh, women farmers in Senegambia that are growing rice and now cannot grow rice because of, you know, climate-related hazards and they have to go into another trade, that's a, that's a cultural loss, you know. So I think the whole aspect of cultural losses is, is also part of the whole gamut of losses um, that should be given, um, given more attention. And then lastly, I would just wanted to say that we have to be able to be, um, use a little bit more foresight um, in terms of how we manage disaster. And this comes with the, the, the crucial necessity to start retrofitting our institutions. Our institutions need to be fit for purpose. And at the moment, many of them are not. Uh, but we also have to retrofit our in infrastructure. You know, we're doing a project um, with the World Bank where we're trying to um, basically um, look at infrastructure differently in terms of climate proofing this infrastructure, um, both in the utilities as well as the water sector. So I think um, the, whole, uh, the whole work around um, building um, resilient infrastructure um, and having smart investments, um, I think, um, is useful also um, to consider, you know, um, when we're talking about disaster risk reduction. Thanks. Oh, one last point, um, climate science. <laughs> Climate science. I don't think we're investing enough in climate science. And uh, maybe Justice um, could talk a little bit about this um, in terms of climate information services. I think unless we understand the correlation between climate science and its ability to predict disease outbreaks, uh, its ability to tell a farmer whether they can plant or not, or what are the, you know, the, the, the risk that they face, unless we understand how central that scientific um, 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 role is, um, we, we're not going far enough. You know? So I think climate science must be a, a part of our mitigation strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I will now open the floor, but I will also ask the panel to think about, as the closing comment, to actually get back to give an example of where a public-private partnership has worked well for you. And if you don't have any, that's okay. I mean, that's also good evidence. <laughs> but if you have them, please share it with us. Um, while I, of course, uh, agree that climate science is important, I think the big problem for the climate science, which is really good today, is to turn it into something concrete. You know, we have IPCC 5, excellent, we have the SREX, which is all about social, economic, health impact, but how to concretize it, I think, is a real challenge. So, the floor is open now, and um, please ask some incisive questions to the panel. Anyone? Justin is first. <laughs> Climate science. 